so let's start so uh, in this course uh, we would need uh, to understand uh, the fundamentals of uh, nmr spectroscopy and so in this uh, lecture uh, i'm going to uh, discuss with you some of the essential aspects of nmr spectroscopy as you know nmr uh, spectroscopy might be is a is a very vast field and there are a lot of things that uh, you would study in future about nmr but uh, what we need is uh, essentially the real basics of nmr so as the uh, uh, name uh, suggests nmr stands for nuclear magnetic resonance okay so uh if if you are uh, familiar with uh, the uh, the instrument uh, called as magnetic resonance imaging mri uh, maybe some of your family members might have used this uh, the principle of of uh, mri is uh, very similar to that of nmr okay so uh, what we'll be studying uh, what we'll be discussing in this in this uh, module today uh you know you will learn that uh you will learn how to uh, sort of interpret spectra you will you will see you will understand what is the basics and you will you will learn how to interpret spectra and uh, you will also uh realize that a lot of things about the proton uh, and the carbon 13 nmr uh, can actually give you i mean the information that you can get is quite uh, huge so before we start uh, let's just go to a little bit of basics so what we are going to do now is just take a, a hydrogen atom okay in a magnetic field okay so when there is an applied uh, magnetic field let's say it's in this direction and this is called applied magnetic field okay so what happens is that uh, if you know the there is one uh, proton uh, in hydrogen and one electron of course so in the nucleus uh, you have the the one proton actually splitting into two energy states so one is the lower energy state and the other one is the higher energy state okay so these two energy states are basically nothing but one where the spin of the nucleus is aligned or the proton is aligned with the magnetic field and where the spin of the proton is opposing the magnetic field okay so the lower energy state is the one where it is aligned with the magnetic field and the higher energy state is nothing but it is opposed to the applied magnetic field okay so even if you don't understand this concept very much what you need to understand is that uh, when uh, hydrogen atom is exposed to a magnetic field uh, then there is a splitting of two states where there is a higher energy state and a lower energy state and this is because of the what is known as the nuclear spin okay so now the nuclear spin is represented by uh i okay and uh the total number of energy levels for a particular nucleus is 2 into i plus 1 okay so in the case of hydrogen uh you know each state the hydrogen the spin value is half so 2 into 1 by 2 plus 1 so you can cancel out this 2 and this 2 so basically it is two states okay so for a proton for a hydrogen atom there are two energy states okay so uh, again this is uh, we are not going to go into uh, more complex details of, with uh, nmrs of of uh, of uh, atoms which have uh, different spin values uh, but suffice to say that with the two important atoms that we are looking at are proton and carbon so in the case of carbon there is c13 and again the i value is half and so you will again see the same two states for c13 okay now 
let's uh, think about this uh, in a in a little bit uh, in a slightly different uh, pictorial manner so what we are going to look at is how the uh, energy state is going to look like around the nucleus okay so this is a this is a, a obviously a cartoon it's not it's not real uh, because as you know uh, you know electrons exist there is a duality of electrons it's both a wave as well as a particle uh, so uh, therefore this is just a, a cartoon to understand it so let's imagine that the nucleus Uh, is in the center here and there is a uh, electronic orbit around it or cloud around it okay now what can happen is when you have the magnetic field i'm just calling it as applied magnetic field amf it let's say it's in this direction now what happens is that you can have electrons which are spinning like this and electrons which are spinning like like this okay so what happens is that this electronic cloud uh, actually uh, can shield what it can do is it it can actually shield the nucleus from the magnetic field okay so this process is called as shielding okay so this shielding is an important characteristic characteristic uh, that is useful uh, because it helps uh, us understand the nature of the nucleus okay so imagine that uh, you are you have a nucleus uh, and it has an electronic cloud of like this okay and uh, this electron cloud versus for example something uh, like this where you have a, a nucleus and you have the electronic cloud which is uh, significantly uh, less uh, or more shielded okay so if i compare these two systems i can see here that this would be more shielded and this uh, on the left would be less shielded okay so this helps us uh, understand uh, the nature of the proton because each hydrogen there Uh, can have based on the local environment or near the hydrogen it can actually have different types of shielding or deshielding this property is very useful when we try to understand the nature of the hydrogen okay you'll get a hang for this as we move forward but the important concept here to understand is that the nature of electrons or electronic environment determines the properties of that hydrogen or the level at which this uh, hydrogen is going to uh, or how much the hydrogen is going to interact with the uh, magnetic field okay so now let's just take an example we'll uh, do several examples in this lecture uh, but let's just take one example and uh, we are going to uh, look at the molecule ch3 ch2 oh okay so now if i look here i have a carbon here i have another carbon here and all i'm going to do is i'm going to measure the c13 nmr spectrum okay so i'm just going to draw the nmr spectrum here don't worry about the details of the scale we'll get to that soon but uh, let's say i i have a scale of uh, 0 to uh, 200 okay and and this is actually represented in ppm we'll get to that uh, very shortly and what is this what uh, the term that is uh, commonly used uh, to to describe this is chemical shift okay so this is the the scale that is used we'll get to uh, some of these details very soon and what we do is uh, if we record the nmr spectrum of this then i'm just going to uh, draw out some numbers here so that we can understand 20 40 60 80 100 and 120 and so on okay so if i if we draw the if i look at the record the nmr spectrum of this uh, uh, of this compound then you see uh, a peak around uh, 20 ppm okay so this is one peak that you see and the second peak uh, you see uh, is around uh, 60 ppm okay so therefore from this nmr analysis you see that there are two types of 
carbons. Okay. So, a simple atom, simple uh, molecule such as ethanol, okay, you have this carbon here, this carbon here and of course, the rest of it is, there are no further carbons on this, but even a molecule such as ethanol, there are two types of carbons. Okay. Uh, now, if you want to understand this NMR spectrum, then we need to understand what happens during the behavior, or I mean how the behavior of the atom is affected by the local environment. Okay. Now, let us understand a little bit about this chemical shift. So, chemical shift. Okay. So, what uh, chemical shift is basically, you know, the scale uh, is, in, is in what is known as parts per million. Okay. So, this is called as P P m. So, here is the parts per million. Okay. So, this P P m is the scale that is used for in while recording NMR spectroscopy. All right. Now, the exact frequency at which the nucleus resonates depends on the external magnetic field. Okay. So, if you recall, uh, if you see here, uh, if you remember what we did was there are uh, two uh, uh, states, one is where it is uh, uh, applied magnetic field and then there are two states, one where it opposes uh, and one where it is aligning with the external magnetic field. Okay. So, the frequency at which this resonates, the particular proton or carbon resonates depends on the external magnetic field. Okay. And if the sample is run on a machine with a, which has a different magnetic field, then this frequency will change. That means that the chemical shift will change. So, therefore, the way in which we understand this is we uh, define a, a term called as chemical shift, which is delta, which is nothing but the frequency in hertz at which it resonates minus the frequency of a standard. Okay. I am going to draw this again in the next page. So, chemical shift is defined as delta. So, this is chemical shift. Okay. So, this is defined as the frequency in hertz of the sample minus frequency of a standard, which is again in hertz divided by the operating frequency, which is in megahertz. Okay, so, megahertz is nothing but 10 power 6 hertz equal to 1 megahertz. Okay, so, if you see here, the two important terms here are basically, uh, this is a, uh, if you subtract uh, one from the other, you get hertz and then you divide that by megahertz. This is nothing but parts per million. Okay. So, the chemical shift is defined as uh, something uh, where you, uh, you do it, uh, you do uh, the unit of this is basically a parts per million because the hertz is going to get cancelled out. All right. So, now this is useful because wherever, whichever operating frequency that you use here, the operating frequency will of course determine the, the separation of the of the energy levels etcetera, but you can now you have a system wherein you can account for the differences in the magnetic field. Okay. Now, let us uh, look very briefly at the reference. So, the standard that we are going to use here is tetramethyl silane. Okay. So, basically it is silicon which is flanked by 4 methyl groups. So, there are 3 I am writing it as Me and the fourth one I am writing it as CH3. Okay. So, now if I look at the electronegativity of carbon electronegativity of carbon is uh, 2.5 and you may recall that electronegativity is uh, is a term which is used to understand how much the 
you know the particular atom likes to pull electrons so the larger the value the the more uh, electron pulling capability uh, oxygen which is of course uh, which we know is more electronegative has a higher value uh, but now if i look at silicon silicon is 1.8 okay so the electronegativity of silicon is uh, less than that of carbon right so therefore what is expected is that if you take a carbon next to a silicon such as in this case then the electron that is going to be pulled it's going to be towards the carbon okay now what happens is that we uh, assign the the frequency at which this tetramethyl silane uh, operates that chemical shift is assigned as zero okay so once you assign that as zero then the rest of the uh, of the uh, spectrum uh, becomes easy to to determine okay so this is how a typical proton nmr spectrum is going to look like 2 4 6 8 and 10 2 4 6 8 and 10 okay so now you will see here that uh, the proton nmr spectrum typically is in the range between 0 and 12 whereas the carbon is between uh, 0 and uh, 200 so we'll get to that again later so as we discuss the unit is chemical shift and i mean the x axis is uh, chemical shift and the units is ppm okay so what we do here is that when you record the nmr spectrum of tms then uh, tms appears here as a peak which is zero okay so tetramethyl tetramethyl silane shows up here as me 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 ch3 so these hydrogens show up as a single peak at zero so this becomes the reference for us to move forward with okay so now when we want to see about uh, how to understand chemical shift let's uh, try to look at it from a pictorial standpoint so there are many terms that we have sort of looked at so far so the first term is uh, let's say let's take a c13 nmr as the example so as i told you the scale is from 0 to 200 now what we have uh, have been sort of discussing is that there is a frequency at which the the magnetic field uh, is is present you know there's a, there's a field and then there is a frequency at which this uh, there's a resonance that happens and then there is shielding and then there is deshielding uh, and then uh, we have talked talked about chemical shift uh, being high low etc etc okay so i'm just going to try and draw this out in one uh, picture so that you uh, you know so you you get the complete picture so even if you don't understand uh, too many of these uh, concepts very clearly so when i talk about uh, carbon 13 it is between 0 and 200 and the same scale would be between 0 and approximately let's say 10 for a proton nmr okay so what are the regions so now if i uh, look at a region which is uh, close to zero then that region actually is called as the lower or a small chemical shift so let me write chemical shift so this is a region where it is low that is numerically the value is low and this is a region where the numerically the chemical shift value is high okay so that is the first thing that we look at chemical shift whether the it is low or high so something for example uh, that uh, resonates or gives you a chemical shift at of about 2 or 3 is is, uh, is considered low and something that gives about in proton and nmr about 7 or 8 or 9 or 10 is considered high so similarly when the chemical shift is between 10 20 30 in c13 and nmr it's considered low whereas a number at around 150 160 180 etc is considered as high okay so that is one way to understand it okay so 50 100 150 and let me just keep a similar uh, scale here of uh, you know uh, 2.5 5 7.5 and 
Okay. So, uh, that is the first term that we all need to understand. Right. The second important term that we need to look at is shielding. Okay. So, if you remember what we what we discussed was how much around the nucleus whether the size of the electron cloud is very large or very small uh, in, in, a, in a very cartoon uh, type uh, uh, sort of understanding uh, is you know whether it is like this or like this is what is going to uh, talk about uh, whether it is uh, shielded or de-shielded. So, clearly this uh, is uh, more shielded than this and so when we look at uh, shielding, the shielding is going to be the more shielded the nucleus is the smaller the chemical shift. Okay. So, this would be highly shielded or shielding is high whereas, this is going to be low shielding okay, or it is called de-shielded. Okay. So, this term on the right, so for example, this region if I have to draw a dotted lines here and dotted line here, then this region on the right where uh, let us say it uh, in carbon 13 it operates between let us say 0 and 50 is called highly shielded okay? and the other side is called very poorly shielded or low shielded or de shielded. Okay? The next thing that is important is frequency. Okay? So, this is a very it is a mathematical term. So, it is very easy for you to go back and look at it because delta is defined as the frequency in hertz minus frequency of the tetramethyl silane divided by the operating frequency. right? So, therefore, it is a very mathematical term. So, it just directly correlates with the number. So, this will be a low frequency and this is going to be a high frequency. Okay? So, therefore, uh, in some term, some ways you need to understand uh, these terms a little better uh, because uh, these, these will, will come back again and again. So, I will repeat. Uh, so, something that has a low chemical shift is usually highly shielded and resonates at a low frequency. Okay? Uh, so, there is also uh, another term which you will call as using field which I am not going to really use which is called up field and down field. Uh, so, we will avoid those terms uh, in this uh, lecture. Okay? Mm -hmm.